Okay, it looks like we're about ready to go live. Make sure my notifications are do not disturb. my zoom window there we go welcome to love and money secrets tv i'm dame lillian walker your host and today we are starting a brand new book and it is called breaking the habit of becoming yourself it's by dr joe dispenza so let's get started i'm so excited to share this information with you so your brain has evolved and involved in everything you do, including how you think, how you feel, how you act, and how well you get along with other people. It's the organ of personality, character, intelligence, and every decision you make. From my brain imaging work with tens of thousands of patients worldwide over the past 20 years, it is very clear to me that when your brain works right, you work right. And when your brain is troubled, you are much more likely to have trouble in your life. With a healthier brain, you are happier, physically healthier, wealthier, wiser, and just make better decisions, which helps you become more successful and live longer. When the brain is not healthy for whatever reason, such as a head injury or past emotional trauma, people are sadder, sicker, poorer, less wise, and less successful. It's easy to understand how trauma can hurt the brain, but researchers have also been seen how negative thinking and bad programming from our past can also affect it. So for example, I grew up with an older brother who was intent on shoving me around. The constant tension and fear I felt then led to a higher level of anxiety, anxious thinking patterns, and always being on guard never knowing when something bad was about to happen. This fear caused long-term overactivity in my brain's fear centers until I was able to work through it later in life. In breaking the habit of being yourself, my colleague, Dr. Joe Dispenza is your guide to optimize both the hardware and software of your brain to help you reach a new state of mind. His new book is based on solid science. And he continues to speak with kindness and wisdom as he did in the award-winning film, What the Bleep Do We Know? And in his first book, Evolve Your Brain. Even though I think of the brain like a computer with both hardware and software, the hardware, the actual physical function of the brain is not separate from the software or the constant programming and reshaping that occurs throughout our lives. They have a dramatic impact on each other most of us have, have had some sort of trauma of some kind in our lives and live with the day-to-day -day scars that have resulted. Cleaning out those experiences that have become part of the brain's structure can be incredibly healing. So of course, engaging in brain healthy habits, such as proper diet and exercise and certain brain nutrients is critical to the brain working right. But in addition, your moment by moment thoughts exert a powerful healing effect on the brain, or they can work to your detriment. The same is true for past experiences that become wired in the brain. So the study we do at the Amen clinics is called brain spect imaging, spect single photon emission, computed tomography is a nuclear medicine study that looks at blood flow and activity patterns. It is different from CT scans or MRI, which examine the brain's anatomy because SPECT looks at how the brain functions. Our SPECT work, now over 70,000 scans, has taught us so many important life lessons about the brain, such as brain injuries can ruin people's lives, alcohol, is not a health food and often shows significant damage on spec scans. A number of medications people routinely take, such as common anti-anxiety medications, are not good for the brain. And diseases like Alzheimer's actually start in the brain decades 
before people have any symptoms. SPECT scans have also taught us that as a society, we need to have much more love and respect for the brain, and that allowing children to play contact sports like football and hockey is not a smart idea. One of the most exciting lessons I have learned is that people can literally change their brains and change their lives by engaging in regular brain healthy habits, such as correcting negative beliefs and using meditative processes, such as those discussed by Dr. Dispenza. In one series of studies, we published the practice of meditation, such as what Dr. Dispenza recommends, boosted blood flow to the pre frontal cortex, the most thoughtful part of the human brain. After eight weeks of daily meditation, the prefrontal cortex at rest was stronger and the memories of our subjects were better too. There are so many ways to heal and optimize the brain. My hope is that like me, you will develop brain envy and want a better functioning brain. The brain imaging work we do has changed everything in my own life. Shortly after I started ordering spec scans in 1991, I decided to look at my own brain. I was 37 years old. When I saw the toxic, bumpy appearance, I knew it was not healthy. All of my life, I have been someone who rarely drank alcohol, never smoked, and never used an illegal drug. Then why did my brain look so bad? Okay, I'm going to pause right here because if this is, think about, it, this is Dr. Daniel Amen. And Dr. Daniel Amen, as if you don't know who Dr. Daniel Amen is, I encourage you to look him up on Google and on YouTube. He's done countless PBS specials. Uh, he's a worldwide renowned neuroscientist, neurologist, and brain expert. And he is, he has incredible an incredible body of work, especially dealing with NFL football players who 100% of NFL football players, by the way, have um, basically brain damage. They have all have TBIs to some greater, some lesser, um, but all of them have TBIs. And a lot of them have aberrant behavior and a lot of different health problems. And it's because of those TBIs because they don't have healthy brains. So oh, it looks like we've got somebody who's wanting to join our Zoom. So let's see here, Paulette, welcome to uh, Love and Money Secrets TV. We are just talking about Daniel Amen here as we're talking about the book, Breaking the Habit of Becoming Yourself. Uh, how are you doing tonight? Wonderful, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so I'm gonna put you on mute and we're gonna keep on talking and, um, and then we're gonna open this up for discussion, okay? Thank you. All right. So let me hit the mute button here just for, okay. So as I was saying, he has an incredible body of work working with NF, the NFL and it's incredible. There's a tremendous number of those players who have been officially diagnosed prior to them even working with Dr. Daniel Amen as having different degrees of brain damage. And most of conventional medicine was saying that you know, once you have brain damage, it's not reversible and it was a permanent thing. However, because of the strategies in the application of um, certain systems, if you will, that Dr. Dan Daniel Amen has, which includes basically nutrition, no sugar, um, different nutritional supplements that will encourage the neurological pathways of the brain to grow and to regrow and for neurons to reform and to re-express themselves. Now, I can speak from two fronts. I have been a fan of Dr. Daniel Amen for years and never did I ever think myself that I was going to actually need his services. And then as some of you know, if you followed and read with me, the Becoming Supernatural book, chapters one through 14 and the afterward, you'll know that I've spoken about the traumatic brain injury, the accident that I had in 2017, when I was hit while I was riding my bike, I was hit by an Orange County Transit Authority bus. I went flying, had a traumatic brain injury, neck injury, lower back injury, also, you know, um, injured my right leg, have, still have a scar, you know, from that and multiple things that have happened. Um, you know, I'm not 100% um, healed from that. I'm still doing the meditation, still trying to heal myself 100%. 
but I'm considerably better, considerably better than I was before. And not only did I have the opportunity to work with Daniel Amen as a patient, but I also worked on a film called Quiet Explosions, where Emmy Award winning producer and writer Jerry Schur did this film. And um, I was part of the crew where we produced and we shot this. And we had Dr. Daniel Amen as one of the experts that came on to talk about the quiet explosions that occur in the brain and how. Oftentimes people, you know, whether they're football players, whether they're vets who have suffered traumatic brain injuries, you know, on combat field or people who have suffered brain injuries and unbeknownst to them, they're, they're walking around with TBIs and have certain behaviors that they think are now normal to them because they've grown so accustomed to them. But some of these injuries were from when they were in high school and when they played football or when they were in high school and got hit in the head by a baseball or soccer, the multiple repeatedly banging on the you know front part of their head or the side of the head, and that rattling sensation where your brain is, you know, you have shaken brain syndrome that occurs from that. And so he is a wonderful advocate about that. And so I can speak from firsthand experience as not only you know a reader of his books and as a fan of his work and the incredible strides that he's made, but also as a patient and also as being, you know as part of principal photography and production of the movie quiet explosions, which you guys have to watch that when it premieres, we were supposed to premiere in March. And of course the quarantine hit. And so the governor said no gatherings and we had to postpone that premiere. Who knows when we'll be premiering that film, but I'll be sure to let you know once it is, um, once we do um, have the film premiere, but it has to do with the quiet, quiet explosions of the brain that people are walking around with. Basically, you're like a walking time bomb. And some people have fits of anger and rage and they don't under, They don't know, maybe they didn't used to be that way, but maybe ever since they were a teenager or ever since they were in their 20s, from that point forward, they started to develop this impulse, lack of control, weight problems, depression, bipolar symptoms, a whole myriad of things. So the bottom line is that here we have Dr. Daniel Amen who hasn't been somebody who has abused alcohol, never smoked and never used an illegal drug and his brain looked bad. So can you imagine for those of us who socially drink a drink here or there, for those of us, I never smoked. Um, I don't do illegal drugs of any sort. I don't even take over the counter drugs. I don't even take Tylenol or Advil or acetaminophen or I, even even with this accident, I used meditation. I tried to the best of my ability to use the meditation because I knew that meditation for pain control works. Um, and so here's somebody who didn't abuse their brain, didn't load a lot of sugar into it, didn't load a lot of alcohol. Another thing, a lot of a lot of you may not know this. I have a strong background in I was pre-med biological sciences at USC and I actually have a lineage behind me of over a thousand years of hospitalers who were the original people who basically opened up hospitals so that the common person, first of all, first it was for children and then it was for the common person. So that not, not just nobility would have access to healthcare, but so that the common person would actually have healthcare available to them. And so that being said, one of the things that I remember, I'll never forget in organic chemistry when we learned that alcohol basically turns into sugar in the body as it metabolizes. So, and if you see, if you look at the chemical formula, you'll see actually how the structure of the molecules actually turn into sugar. Um, another thing that people don't think about because you have to pay attention to your sugar intake because sugar increases the acidity in your body, your brain bathed in acid doesn't do very well. Um, it, you know, it does better with proteins and there's certain types of proteins, of course, that are better than others. So the, my point being is that here is somebody who didn't abuse alcohol, didn't abuse drugs, didn't, didn't smoke. And yet he, he had his brain didn't look good. So if you have been smoking most of your life, if you make no mistakes, if you smoke weed, don't fool yourself and say, oh, I don't smoke. All I do, all I smoke is weed, you know, marijuana, pot, uh, that's smoking. And there's even commercials now I know that are out where, you know, people say, oh, no, I don't smoke. And it's like, oh, I only, 
I only smoke weed. And then of course the, the guy in the commercial is like, Oh no, I don't, I don't like girls who, who smoke. And I'm like, but I don't smoke. I just, I do weed. It's like, it's smoking, make no mistakes. So the bottom line is that if you are a frequent drinker of alcohol, alcohol turns into, into sugar in your body, which is not good. It creates an acidic environment. Um, rice, pasta, a lot of carbs turn into sugar. You can offset that if you know how to combine, do a certain amount of food combining, you can offset that and alkalize your body, which when you do meditation, when you do deep breathing exercises, and even, even without meditation, deep breathing exercises alkalize the body. So there are things that you can do to offset that. So you can still have like me, you can't take away pasta and rice for me. I'm Spanish and Italian. Hello. You know, we have rice or pasta every single day. We have it. We also have a lot of green leafy vegetables, yada, yada, yada. So let's find out why his brain looks so bad. And this is interesting because now he's, he's looking at himself as not only the neurologist, but also as the patient. So before I really understood about brain health, I had many bad brain habits. I ate lots of fast food. I've never been a big fast food fan, but there was a period in my life that I had my share of happy meals, I will confess. So he had a lot of fast food, drank diet soda. Another pause. There's a clue in diet soda why you should not be drinking diet soda. And I've always said, don't eat anything that's sugar-free, fat-free. Okay, sugar-free, fat-free, or diet. First of all, the word die is in diet. You drop the tea and it's diet. Why would I drink a drink that's inferring death? No, uh, I can go off on some chemistry aspects about diet foods that are allegedly diet foods, low fat, fat free, sugar free, etc. Everybody I know who eats that group of foods all have weight problems. I have never eaten any of those foods and have never had a weight problem. And then of course, people will probably say, oh, it's genetics. I don't think it's just genetics. I think that genetics has a part in that uh, realm, but I think also what you eat, how you eat, when you eat makes a big difference. And that's what he will disclose in just a few minutes here. So he talks about how I ate lots of fast food, drank diet soda like she was my best friend. I've known people who replaced diet soda. They drink that instead of water because they don't like water. And then 20 years after drinking diet soda, they start to have kidney problems, of course. Um, he said, often slept only four to five hours a night and carried unexamined hurts from the past. Okay, preaching to the choir here because I've been infamous for pulling all nighters when I was in college and throughout my career. And it wasn't until I was, I think, in my early 40s when I started realizing this, even though it's not difficult for me to do, it's probably not the healthiest thing to do. And the reality is that there was a study that was conducted that was highlighted by a show called 2020 where they showed side by side people who had been sleep deprived next to people who had had two or three drinks. And they put them both behind the wheel of a car and put them on the exact same obstacle course where they had to drive kind of making S's around pylons on the asphalt in a, in a very large parking lot. And would you believe that the drunks did better than the sleep deprived people? Yes, my friends. So when I saw that I was about four years old and I was horrified. I was aghast to see that the people who were sleep deprived, because I've always prided myself in saying, you know, I don't get drunk. Why? Because I usually don't have more than one or two drinks when I drink. I usually, and then it takes me hours to finish one drink. So I'm a sipper. I don't like drinking, drinking. I like, if I'm out with friends and stuff, I like sipping on whatever the drink is, whether it's wine, champagne, a mojito, whatever the case might be, I like sipping it. Well, 
Turns out the drunks in this test, and there was a lot of conclusive evidence from other universities apparently, and these were all college age students. So they were all students, I think they were juniors and seniors that were in college, and the one control group was sleep deprived for two nights, three nights in a row, and the other group had had, um, I think, three to four drinks, and they were men and women. Okay, so slept only four to five hours a night and carried unexamined hurts from the past. I think we're all guilty of that. Heck, for a long time, for a long time, I didn't have any hurts from the past. And then I did. And then, of course, I carried them with me. And then I had to figure out how to let them go and forgive and so on and so forth. So then he goes on to say, I didn't exercise, felt chronically stressed and carried an extra 30 pounds. Wow. What I didn't know was hurting me and not just a little. So I wonder how many of you right now, what a coincident that you happen to be watching this video at this very point in time maybe one two three all or a few of these are things that you yourself are doing this might be your wake-up call to say hey you know carrying that extra 10 20 30 pounds feeling chronically stressed albeit right now with everything that's going on in our world a lot of people are feeling very stressed and then believe it or not there's a lot of people there's a lot of us who aren't feeling stressed right now, especially if we, if it's part of this community who's really been diving deep into meditation and prayer and mindful practices. So he says here, my last scan looks healthier and much younger than it did 20 years earlier. My brain has literally aged backwards. That's how changeable your brain is too. When you make up your mind to take care of it properly, after seeing my original scan, I wanted my brain to be better. This book will help yours be better too. I hope you enjoy reading it as much as I did. Daniel G. Amen, MD, author of Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. Okay, so we're gonna get started here with chapter, actually the introduction and then we'll get into chapter one. Introduction. The greatest habit you can ever break is the habit of being yourself. When I think about all the books on creating the life we desire, I realize how many of us are still looking for approaches that are grounded in sound scientific evidence methods that truly work. But already new research into the brain and body, the mind and consciousness, and a quantum leap in our understanding of physics is suggesting expanded possibilities on how to move toward what we innately know is our real potential. As a practicing chiropractor who runs a busy integrated health clinic and as an educator in the fields of neuroscience, brain function, biology, and brain chemistry, I have been privileged to be at the forefront of some of this research not just by studying the fields mentioned above, but also by observing the effects of this new science once applied by common people like you and me. That's the moment when the possibilities of this new science becomes reality, also known as realized. So as a consequence, I have witnessed some of the remarkable changes in individuals' health and quality of life when they truly change their minds. So over the last several years, I have had the opportunity to interview a host of people who overcame significant health conditions that were considered either terminal or permanent. Per the contemporary model of medicine, these recoveries were labeled spontaneous remissions. However, upon my extensive examination of their inner journeys, it became apparent to me that there was a strong element of mind involved and their physical changes weren't so spontaneous after all. This discovery furthered my postgraduate studies in brain imaging, neuroplasticity, epigenetics, and psychoimmunology. So I want to call attention to this because I want you to recognize that Dr. Joe Dispenza is not only a chiropractor, but he did further his postgraduate studies and did specializations in brain imaging. No wonder he does all those EEGs at so many of the monasteries when we attend the seven day advanced uh, events. 
So brain imaging, neuroplasticity, epigenetics, which Dr. Bruce Lipton is not only a friend, but he is also a colleague of Dr. Joe Dispenza's and has, has, has been a guest on my radio show, The Bottom Line Show Live. He is a father of modern day epigenetics. He started doing stem cell cloning in 1967. If you don't know who he is, he is the author of The Biology of Belief. Google, watch his videos. He's recently been very, very vocal about what's going on uh, throughout this entire planet. So it would be a good investment of your time to educate yourself and listen to a few hours of what Dr. Bruce Lipton has to say. Him and Dr. Joe Dispenza share the stage often um, throughout the world. And so he's the father. He's the one who basically in invented um, epigenetics. And if you don't know what epigenetics is, um, for right now I'm going to say Google it, but it's basically letting, it's the, we, he proved scientifically that cells are not controlled by the DNA. They're not controlled by the nucleus of the cell, that the cell membrane is not the nucleus, that in fact, it is the cell membrane that surrounds the outer layer of the cell as it reacts with the environment. That's what controls the expression of that cell, which was a game changer. Okay. And last but not least, psychoneuroimmunology. So I simply figured that something had to be happening in the brain and body that could be zeroed in on and then replicated. In this book, I want to share some of what I learned along the way and show you by exploring how mind and matter are interrelated and how you can apply these principles, not only to your body, but to any aspect of your life. Boy, ain't that the truth. So going beyond knowing to knowing how. So many readers of my first book, Evolve Your Brain, The Science of Changing Your Mind, voiced the same honest and heartfelt request, along with a fair amount of positive feedback, such as the person who wrote, quote, I really liked your book. I read it twice. It had lots of science and was very thorough and inspiring. But can you tell me how to do it? How do I evolve my brain? I think that's a great question. And I think... That is at the heart of what most people care about. You know, if something works, okay, great that you're telling me that it works, but let's move on to exactly what did you do that I can duplicate so that I can potentially receive the same results. Doesn't that make sense? So in response, I began teaching a workshop series on the practical steps anyone can take to make changes at the level of the mind and the body that will lead to lasting results. Consequently, I have seen people experience unexplainable healings, release old mental and emotional wounds, resolve so-called impossible difficulties, create new opportunities and experience wonderful health. Just to name a few, you will meet some of those people in these pages and it's not necessary that you read my first book to digest the material in this one. But if you have been exposed to my work, I wrote Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself to serve as a practical how-to companion to evolve your brain. It is my earnest objective to make this new book simple and easy to understand. There will be times though that I will have to give you bits of knowledge to act as the forerunner to a concept I want to develop. The purpose is to build a realistic working model of personal transformation that will help you understand how we can change. So breaking the habit of being yourself is a product of one of my passions, a sincere effort to demystify the mystical so that every person understands that we have within our reach all we need to make significant changes in our lives. This is a time when not only do we want to know, but we want to know how. How do we apply and personalize both emerging scientific concepts and age-old wisdom to succeed at living a more enriched life? When you and I can connect the dots of what science is discovering about the nature of reality, and when we give ourselves permission to apply those principles in our day-to-day -day experience and existence, then each of us becomes both a mystic and a scientist in our own life. So I invite you to experiment with everything that you learn in this book 
and to objectively observe the results. What I mean is that if you make the effort to change your inner world of thoughts and feelings, your external environment should begin to give you feedback to show you that your mind has had an effect on the outer world. Why else would you do it? So if you take intellectual information that you learn as a philosophy, and then you initiate that knowledge into your life by applying it enough times until you master it, you will ultimately move from being a philosopher to an initiate to a master. Stay tuned. There is sound scientific evidence that this is possible. I do ask you up front to keep an open mind so that we can build, so that we can build step by step the concepts I outline in this book. All of this information is for you to do something with. Otherwise, it's just good dinner conversation, isn't it? Once you can open your mind to the way things really are and let go of your conditioned beliefs with which you are accustomed to framing reality, let us pause here because I want you to pay close attention to the languaging here. As some of you uh, know, I am very big on doing neuro health resets to help link and sync the left and the right hemisphere of the brain to help you relieve from pain. Whether the pain is physical or emotional, spiritual or psychological, makes no difference. Whether you have a belief that it works or not makes no difference either because it taps into neuroplasticity and the eight different sensory systems of the body. And it's how your body, how your brain, the organ actually categorizes everything that it sees, smells, tastes, hears, touches, and senses. That's why it doesn't matter whether you believe or not. And here he said something critical, which is why I'm, I'm pointing it out. If you are reading in your books at home, whether it's on your Kindle, your iPad, or a physical book, highlight. Let go of your conditioned beliefs with which you are accustomed to framing reality. Put a circle around framing reality as well as highlighting that phrase. Because make no mistakes, your brain as it categorizes and files information, it's like your brain has like a filing cabinet and it stores by relevance information. Information it's never heard of before, you're firing and wiring 2,600 neurological pathways of the brain's neurons are just like going off like crazy, like a Christmas tree, like little twinkle lights, boom, 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 boom. If it's something that you've heard before, half the neurons and neurological pathways of the brain are enacted. So it's half the light, half the energy, half the electricity is wiring and firing. You're actually smarter by listening, by reading, by learning this information you're actually getting smarter. Not only are you learning things, you're being exposed to new information. You're also being challenged to how you frame reality because scientists have actually proven from a quantum level to a 3D outward experience level, how things actually work and the truth and how by reframing your reality, once you know how things actually work, you understand it, then with more conviction, with more faith, with more fervor, you go at it because you have an understanding understanding at a deeper level. Does that make sense? Okay, so you are now framing, your, your, as we speak, you're reframing your reality. You should see the fruits of your efforts. That is my wish for you. The information in these pages is there to inspire you to prove to yourself that you are in fact, a divine creator. We should never wait for science to give us the permission to do the uncommon. If we do, then we are turning science into another religion. We should be brave enough to contemplate our lives, do what we thought was outside of the box, and do it repeatedly. When we do that, we are on our way to a greater level of personal power. True Empowerment comes when we start to look deeply at our beliefs. We may find their roots in the conditioning of religion, culture, society, education, family, the media, and even our genes, the latter being imprinted by the sensory experiences of our current lives, as well as untold generations before. When then 
we weighed those old ideas against some new paradigms that may serve us better. Times are in fact changing. Make no mistakes, we see that going on big time. We've had massive change since the last week of February to this very day. So as individuals awaken to a greater reality, we are part of a much larger sea of change. Our current systems and models of reality are breaking down. They sure are. And it is time for something new to emerge. Across the board, our models for politics, economics, religion, science, education, medicine, and our relationship with the environment are all showing a different landscape than just 10 years ago. Big time pause button. In fact, I should get one of those, you know, the staples. We've got those red buttons that you hit it and it says that was easy. I wish I had one that said pause. I could hit the pause button. I want, you know, stone's throw from where, where I am right now. Here in Huntington Beach, we have bioluminescent beaches now. Right at sunset for several hours, we, you know, we've had the red tides, the algae, their dinoflagellates. The population of dinoflagellates is so high because there's such little pollution and the ocean has been able to breathe and repropagate itself and reproduce. And the water's clear that we have a much larger, like probably the biggest red tide I've ever seen in my lifetime. And that gives way to the dinoflagellates glowing at nighttime because they absorb the light during the day because they're biophotonic. And boom, we have these incredible waves. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just go to YouTube and do bioluminescent waves, Huntington Beach, Newport Beach, it's a phenomena that's been taking place for the better part of a month now. And it goes from San Diego all the way to Venice Beach, California. And uh, we also have it in the Channel Islands. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine the Channel Islands it must be spectacular right now. Uh, Santa Cruz and oh my gosh, Santa Rosa. That's, a, that's literally a Virgin Island. So that's showing us a, di a very different landscape right now. We're also seeing bluer skies, cleaner air. So that's just two, three pretty obvious things that are going on right, right now as this video is live streaming. So letting go of the outmoded and embracing the new sounds easy. But as I pointed out in Evolve Your Brain, much of what we have learned and experienced has been incorporated into our biological self. And we wear it like a garment, but we also know that what is true today might not be true tomorrow. So just as we have come to question our perception of atoms as solid pieces of matter, reality and our interaction with it is a progression of ideas and beliefs. We also know that to lead the familiar life that we have grown accustomed to and waltz into something new is like a salmon <laughs> swimming upstream. It takes effort. It does. It takes effort. And frankly, it's uncomfortable. You know what? It's uncomfortable, but not that much. To be honest with you, I got to say, it's not that uncomfortable. I think for some people, you know, we all have different personality types. Some people are more resistant to change than others. Some people are more easygoing and they go with the flow and others are not. They're not as flexible. You know, um, one of the things that I love about yoga is they, one of the sayings that we have is that a flexible body is a flexible mind. So if you have a rigid body, the likelihood is that you probably also have a rigid mind. I don't know about you, but... If you think about it, when we have a storm, the clues are in nature everywhere. So like if you look at a storm, trees that are very brittle in a, a big storm, the branches, because they're more brittle and dry, they crack, break. And oftentimes here in, in Huntington Beach, when we've had big storms, we have trees that literally have you know collapsed over, they've like snapped in half. We've had palm trees that have snapped. We've had trees that have snapped. It's a crazy thing to see. And they're big trees. And then the trees that are more flexible and more limber, 
they just like a rubber band, they just sprung back up. They may have been touching the ground and, and being threatened to snap, but because they were green and flexible, they survived the storm. And then, yeah, they've lost a few leaves and stuff, but they, you know, they'll continue. They've been around for 50 years. They'll be around another 50 years, you know, or another 200 years or however long the lifespan of that tree is. And so that I think signaled to us as human beings that we need to be flexible of both body and of mind. So it takes effort and frankly, it's uncomfortable. And to top it off, ridicule, marginalization, opposition, and denigration from those who cling to what they think they know greet us along the way. Those are the ones who don't want change. They want things to stay as they are. You know, like one of the things that I hear right now in this particular environment that we're living, here we are, you know, March 8, May 18th, uh, 2020, is that oh, they can't wait for things to go back to normal. Well, things aren't going to go back to normal. We are going to create a new normal, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is no different than when, when you, you know, if you are a person who's had a child, once you've had a child, things never go back to the way they were normal before you had a child. No, your life will never be the same again. If you were single and you got married, even if you got divorced, you will never go back to normal to what you were pre-single. Even if you become single again, whether it's through divorce, death, what have you, you don't go back to how you were before. No, you create a new normal. And that's what's happening now. We are, we are in a global reset. And this global reset is creating a new normal for everybody, every being, everything, including the plants, the trees, the animals, everything is being affected at this point in time. And it's really obvious, uh, right time, more than any other time in, in this planet's history. So who with such an unconventional bent is willing to meet such adversity in the name of some concept they cannot embrace with their senses, yet which is alive in their minds. How many times in history have individuals who were considered heretics and fools and thus took the abuse of unexceptional emerged as geniuses, saints, or masters? Will you dare to be an original? Think about the first people who challenged the conventional wisdom and said, no, the earth is not flat. The earth, in fact, is actually round. Those first people who started disclosing that information, first, they were ridiculed. They were laughed at. They thought, you know, you guys are charlatans. You're heretics. How could you possibly say you guys have lost all sanity? You're, you're nuts. You're insane. Who really was insane? Those resisting change in light of new information or those who in light of new in, in light of the new information were willing to with an open mind accept it grasp it and take advantage of it because those people who knew that the globe was round knew they couldn't fall off the edge of the earth now all the others who thought it was flat thought oh when you get to that edge of the sea that you're going to fall over into outer space or something so that group is living in fear of the unknown. And now this group over here that has a greater awareness in light of this new knowledge. Ah, yes, we realize that there's more that we don't know, but it's sure nice to know this. When you know better, you do better. Change as a choice instead of a reaction. So it seems that human nature is such that we balk at changing until things get really bad. And we're so uncomfortable that we can no longer go on with business as usual. And this is as true for an individual as it is for a society. I'm gonna pause right here just briefly, just to make a sidebar comment, because one of the things that I've, I've learned throughout my career and over my lifetime is that, you know, each individual has a personality, but make no mistakes. Whether you look at a little group of people, it could be a group of children, it could be a church group, it could be a civic group, it could be a um, charity organization. Uh, it could be a business. Whatever group of individuals, they have a collective personality as well. 
And the city that you live in has a people in your city from one city to another city, like Huntington Beach's personality, even though we're right next to Newport Beach, Newport Beach has a different personality than Huntington Beach. Seal Beach has a different personality than Huntington Beach. Venice Beach has a different personality than, and you know, they're all individualized. The, the sum of each one of those individuals that live in those communities make a collective personality. Our country, we are, you know, founded on a, a group of men who were rugged individualists. That was a much different personality than the subjects to the queen where we, where our forefathers came from. So make no mistakes, groups have a personality as well. And that's what Dr. Joe is talking about here. We wait for crisis, trauma, loss, disease, and tragedy before we get down to looking at who we are, what we're doing, how we're living, what we're feeling, and what we believe or know in order to embrace true change. Often, it takes a worst case scenario for us to begin to make changes that support our health, relationships, career, family, and future. My message is why wait? We can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering, or we can evolve in a state of joy and inspiration. Most embrace the former. So to go with the latter, we just have to make up our minds and change will probably entail a bit of discomfort, some inconvenience, a break from a predictable routine and a period of not knowing. I'm gonna hit the pause button big time here because you know what, no matter what, you're going to have, whether you choose to do that introspective work, to take the time to evolve, change, and become the better version of you or not, you are going to suffer discomfort, inconvenience, and a break from a predictable routine and a period of not knowing not knowing whether you choose to do this work or you choose not to do this work. Either way, you're gonna pay a price. You're gonna go through the pain, you're gonna go through the discomfort. Why not pick the option that gives you a bigger, fuller expression of you where you can experience more love, more joy, more peace, more success, more abundance, more prosperity, more friends, more, more of whatever it is that you want in your life, more creative expression. Why not? But you have the free will to choose or not to choose. If you choose not to choose, if you choose not to choose, by default, you choose to have the discomfort, the inconvenience, a break from the predictable routine and a period of not knowing, getting what you've always gotten to get what you got. Or have the discomfort, the inconvenience, a break from the predictable routine and a period of not knowing, Ah, but because you're embracing a new way of looking and framing things, you could have an expansion of creativity, of, of, of inspiration, of peace, of health, of wealth, of creativity, of joy, of fun, of laughter, new friends, new people, new societies, new places to live. Who knows? The power is in your choice in either direction. That's the exciting part. So most of us are already familiar with the temporary discomfort of not knowing. We stumbled through our early efforts to read until the skill became second nature. When we first practiced the violin or the drums, our parents wished they could send us to a soundproof room. Pity the hapless patient who has had his blood drawn by a medical student who has had the requisite knowledge but still lacks the finesse that she will gain only through practice, absorbing knowledge, knowing, and then gaining practical experience by applying what you learned until a particular skill became ingrained in you, knowing how, is probably how you acquired most of your abilities that now feel like a part of your being. Knowingness, in much the same way, learning how to change your life involves knowledge and the application of what knowledge is. That is why this book is divided into three overarching sections. Throughout parts one and two, I will build ideas in sequence, forming a bigger, broader model of understanding. So for you to personalize, if some ideas seem repetitive, they are there to remind you 
about something that I don't want you to forget, that I want you to remember. So repetition reinforces the circuits in your brain and forms more neural connections so that in your weakest hour, you don't talk yourself out of greatness. When you ease into part three of the book with a sound knowledge base, you can experience for yourself the truth of what you learned earlier. Okay, part one, the science of you. Our exploration will start with an overview of philosophical and scientific paradigms related to the latest research about the nature of reality, who you are, why change has been so difficult for so many, and what is possible for you as a human being. Part one will be an easy read, I promise. Chapter one, the quantum you introduces you to a bit of quantum physics, but don't be alarmed. I start there because it is important that you begin to embrace the concept that your subjective mind has an effect on your objective world. The observer effect in quantum physics states that where you direct your attention is where you place your energy. And us, I'm going to repeat that again because I think that this is this is one of the energetic energy 101 principles that you need to really pay close attention to because it's like the foundation of all of this. The observer effect. So where you take your awareness, your consciousness, and what you focus it on, whether you focus your energy on the tip of your finger, like as I'm speaking right now, most of you don't really feel your body parts. But if I tell you right now, pay attention to the tip of your nose, you'll go, oh, a second ago, you didn't feel your nose at all, let alone the tip of your nose. But now you feel the tip of your nose. Some of you might be thinking, oh, feels a little on the cold side. Or maybe it just feels, you know, a little tingly all of a sudden, just because you're thinking about the tip of your nose. So wherever you put your attention, so the energy is now going to that body part and that's why it's a little tingly. That's why it may feel a little cold, whatever the case might be. Your, you know, everybody's sensation is a little bit different. So the observer effect in quantum physics states that where you direct your attention is where you place your energy. As a consequence, you affect the material world, which, by the way, is maced, made mostly of energy. So, which, by the way, is made mostly of energy. If you entertain that idea, even for a moment, you might start focusing on what you want instead of what you don't want. And you might even find yourself thinking, if an atom is 99.99999% energy and point. 0.00001% physical substance, then I'm actually more nothing than something. So why do I keep my attention on that small percentage of the physical world when I am so much more? Is defining my present reality by what I perceive with my senses the biggest limitation I have? In chapters two through four, we will look at what it means to change, to become greater than the environment, the body and time. Yes, make no mistakes, ladies and gentlemen, friends and gems. I want you to know that you are going to learn to become greater than the environment, your physical body and transcend time. Oh yes, it is magic. So you've probably entertained the idea that your thoughts create your life. But chapter two, overcoming the environment. I discuss how if you allow the outer world to control how you think and feel, your external environment is patterning circuits in your brain to make you think equal to everything familiar to you. The result is that you create more of the same. You hardwire your brain to reflect the problems, personal conditions, and circumstances in your life. So to change, you must be greater than all the things physical in your life. Highlight that, friends and gems. So to change, you, let's highlight it, you must be greater than all physical, all things physical in your life. Everything you touch, see, sense, smell, taste, all of these things. You have to become greater than all these things. And the good news is that it's not that difficult to do. Everybody, 
Nobody is so special that they can't do this. From a five-year-old to a 105-year-old, everybody can do this. And it's exciting because it works. Chapter three, overcoming the body. Continue to look at how we consciously live by a set of memorized behaviors, thoughts, and, re and emotional reactions, all running like a computer program behind the scenes of your subconscious awareness. That's why it is not enough to think positive because most of us who we are might reside subconsciously as negativity in the body. By the end of this book, you will know how to enter into the operating system of the subconscious mind and make permanent changes where those programs exist. Chapter four, overcoming time. I'm gonna hit the pause button here just a quick second. I need to make a little adjustment on my camera. Okay, so we are right now on page two. Let's see. Oh, it says location 281 instead of giving me the page number. Oh, that's funny. Okay, well, it's a different book. And Becoming Supernatural gave me the page number at the bottom. So I apologize for not being able to give you the page number. But we are at the portion of the book where it says chapter four, overcoming time. So examines how we either live in the anticipation of future events or repeatedly revisit past memories or both until the body begins to believe it is living in a time other than the present moment. The latest research supports the notion that we have a natural ability to change the brain and the body by thought alone so that it looks biologically like some future event has already happened because you can make thought more real than anything else. You can change who you are from brain cell to gene, given the right understanding. When you learn how to use your attention and access the present, you will enter through the door to the quantum field where all potentials exist. Chapter five, survival versus creation, illustrates the distinction between living in survival and living in creation. Living in survival entails living in stress and functioning as a materialist, believing that the outer world is more real than the inner world. When you are under the gun of the fire flight nervous system being run by its cocktail of intoxicating chemicals, you are programmed to be concerned only about your body, your physical body, the things or people in your environment and your obsession with time. Your brain and your body are out of balance. You are living a predictable life. However, when you are truly in the elegant state of creation, you are no body, no thing, no time. You forget about yourself. You become pure consciousness, free from the chains of the identity that needs the outer reality to remember who it thinks it is. Part two, your brain and meditation. In chapter six, three brains, thinking to doing to being, you will embrace the concept that you have three brains that allow you to move from thinking to doing to being. Even better, when you focus your attention to the exclusion of your environment, your body and time, you can easily move from thinking to being without having to do anything. In that state of mind, your brain does not distinguish between what is happening in the outer world of reality and what is happening in the inner world of your mind. Thus, if you can mentally rehearse a desired experience via thought alone, via thought alone, you will experience the emotions of that event before it physically manifested. Now you are moving into a new state of being because your mind and body are working as one. When you begin to feel like some potential future reality is happening to you in the moment that you are focusing on it, you are rewiring your automatic habits, attitudes, and other unwanted 
subconscious programs. Mm. Chapter seven, the gap explores how to break free from the emotions that you've memorized, which have become your personality. I'm going to pause right there because you are, most of you who are hearing this for the first time, most of you who are reading this at this very moment in time are just now being given a newsflash. Yes, you are breaking free from the emotions that you've memorized. Make no mistakes. Those emotions you have memorized and those Memorized emotions have become what you think is your personality, which then becomes your personal reality. And how to close the gap between who you really are in your inner private world and how you appear in the outer social world. We all reach a certain point when we stop learning and realize that nothing external can take away those feelings. From our past. If you can predict the feeling of every experience in your life, there is no room for anything new to occur because you are viewing your life from the past instead of the future. Think about it. You're doing a backward reach. You're literally, your brain actually is going neurologically. It reaches backwards spatially. That's how the neuroplasticity of the brain works. It reaches backward in this direction because it's something in the past. That's why you hear people in their language, they'll even say, oh yeah, I put that behind me. Yeah, it's like, yeah, then, then no longer, it's no longer an issue for me because I, I put that behind me a long time ago. Why? Because in the brain, it's actually filed behind you. That's why in some of the different health processes that I do to help people relieve pain, physical, emotional, spiritual, psychological pain, anywhere that they might experience in their body, or if they're trying to manifest more prosperity, abundance, new jobs, new this, new that, I take them through processes neurosomatically and they put the unwanted in the past, retaining the lessons, because sometimes you have resistance to letting things go because your subconscious goes, oh, but there's lessons here that I need to keep. So we have a, I have a method to address that so that you get to have your cake and eat it too. You get to keep the lessons and put in the past, file it away. So it's no longer part of your, your present and it's no longer part of your future. So here we are forward casting, and now you're recalling a memory that you've put forward in the future and bringing it into your now. This is the juncture point where the soul either breaks free or falls into oblivion. You will learn to liberate your energy in the form of emotions and thus narrow the gap between how you appear and who you are. Ultimately, you will create transparency when how you appear is who you are. You are truly free. Part two concludes with chapter eight, meditation demystifying the mystical and waves of your future in which my purpose is to demystify meditation so that you know what you are doing and why. Discussing the brave wave technology made simple. I show you how, to, how your brain changes electromagnetically when you are focused versus when you are in an aroused state due to stressors in your life. You will learn that the true purpose of meditation is to get beyond the analytical mind and enter into the subconscious mind so that you can make real and permanent changes. If you get up from meditation as the same person who sat down, nothing has happened to you on any level. When you meditate and connect to something greater, you can create and then memorize such coherence between your thoughts and your feelings that nothing in your outer reality no thing, no person, no condition at any place or time could move you from that level of energy. Now you are mastering your environment, your body, and time. Part three, stepping toward your new destiny. All of this information in parts one, two is provided in order to equip you with the necessary knowledge so that when you demonstrate and apply this information in part Three, which supplies the how-to 
you will have a direct experience of what you've been taught. Part three is all about applying yourself in actual discipline, a mindful exercise to use in your daily life. It's a step-by-step meditation process created so you can actually do something with the theories given to you. By the way, did your mind balk when I mentioned that multi-step process? If so, it's not what you think. Yes, you will learn a sequence of actions, but soon you will experience them as one or two simple steps. After all, you probably perform multiple actions every time you prepare to drive your car. For example, you adjust your seat, you put on your seatbelt, check your mirror, start the car, turn on the headlights, look around, use a turn signal, apply the brake, put the car in drive or reverse, apply pressure to the gas pedal and so on. Ever since you learned to drive, you have executed this procedure easily and automatically. I assure you the same will be true once you learn each step in part three. You may be asking yourself, why do I need to read parts one and two? I'll just jump to part three. I know, I'd probably be thinking the same. I decided to offer the relevant knowledge in the first two parts of the text so that you get to the third section. Nothing will be left to conjecture, dogma, or speculation. When you begin the steps of the meditation, you'll know exactly what you're doing and why. When you comprehend the what and the why, the more you will know and thus, the more you will know how when the time comes. Therefore, you will have more power and intention behind the practical experience of truly changing your mind. By using these steps in part three, you may be more prone to accept your innate ability to change your so-called impossible situations in your life. You might even give yourself permission to entertain potential realities that you never considered prior to your exposure to these new concepts. You might just begin to do the uncommon. That is my aim for you by the time you finish this book. So if you can resist the temptation to jump ahead to part three, I promise that when you get there, you'll be quite empowered by what you learn. So I've seen this approach work throughout the world in a series of three workshops I lead. And when people gain the right knowledge in such a way that they understand it completely and then have the opportunity for effective instruction to apply what they comprehend, then like magic, they can see the fruits of their efforts in the form of changes that serve as feedback in their lives. So part three will give you the meditative skills to change something within your mind and your body and to produce an effect outside of you. Once you can notice what you did inside of you that produced an outcome outside of you, you'll do it again. When a new experience manifests in your life, You'll embrace the energy you feel in the form of an elevated emotion, such as empowerment, awe, or immense gratitude. And that energy will drive you to do it again and again and again. Now you are on the path of true evolution. Each meditation step delineated in part three is associated with a piece of meaningful information presented earlier in the book. Because you have cultivated the meaning behind exactly what you're doing, There should be no ambiguity that might cause you to lose your vision. So like many skills you've learned in the beginning, it may take all your conscious effort to stay focused as you learn how to meditate, to evolve your brain. In the process, you must restrain yourself from your typical behaviors and maintain your thoughts on what you are doing without wandering to extraneous stimuli. So your actions are aligned with your intention. Just as you might have experienced, when you first learned to cook Thai food, play golf, dance the salsa, or drive a stick shift, the newness of the endeavor will require you to practice this ability continually, training both mind and body to memorize each step. Remember, most types of instruction are formatted in bite-sized chunks so that the mind and body can begin to work together. So once you get it, all the individual steps you kept reviewing merge into one smooth process. The methodical linear approach seamlessly flows into a holistic, effortless, unified demonstration. 
This is the point of personal ownership. At times, the effort this takes can be tedious, but if you persist with a certain amount of will and energy and time, you'll enjoy the results. When you know that you know how to do something, you're on your way to mastering it. I am overjoyed to say that many people around the world are already using the knowledge in this book to make demonstrable changes in their lives. It is my sincere passion that you too break the habit of being yourself and create the new life you desire. So let's get started. Chapter one, give me a brief moment here. I need to check something here on my camera. Alrighty, so now here we go, diving deep. Chapter one, the science of you. Chapter one, the quantum you. Early physicists divided the world into matter and thought and latter matter and energy. Each member of those pairs was considered to be entirely separate from the other, but they're not. Nevertheless, this mind matter duality shaped our early worldview that reality was essentially predetermined and that people could do little to change things through their own actions, let alone their thoughts. Fast forward to our current understanding that we are part of a vast, invisible field of energy which contains all the possible realities and responds to our thoughts and our feelings. Let's highlight this, friends and gems. It says here, we are part of a vast, invisible field of energy which contains all possible realities and responds to our thoughts and feelings. If you have a book, highlight that now because that is a very powerful point. You need to recognize that because we are part, you are part, I am part of a vast invisible field. I am part of that invisible field of energy, which contains all possible realities, all the infinite intelligence. And it responds to my thoughts, to your thoughts, and to my feelings, your feelings. And that's how we mold the clay. So just as today's scientists are exploring the relationship between thought and matter, we are eager to do the same in our own lives. And so we ask ourselves, can I use my mind to create my reality? And if so, is that a skill that we can learn to use to become who we want to be and create the life we want to experience? Let's face it, none of us is perfect. Whether we like to make some change to our physical self, emotional self, or spiritual self, we all have the same desire. We want to live life as an idealized version of who we think and believe we can be. When we stand in front of the mirror and look at our love handles, we don't just see that slightly too pudgy version or vision reflected in the glass, we also see, depending on our mood that day, a slimmer, fitter version of ourselves or a heavier, chunkier version. Which of our, image, which of our images is real? When we lie in bed at night, reviewing our day and our efforts to be more tolerant, less reactive person, we don't just see the parent who lashed out at our child for failing to quietly and quickly submit to a simple request, we envision either an angelic self whose patience was stretched like an innocent victim on the rack or a hideous ogre laying waste to a child's self-esteem. Which of those images is real? The answer is all of them are real and not just those extremes, but an infinite spectrum of images ranging from positive to negative. So how can that be? For you to better understand why none of those versions of self is more or less real than others, I'm going to have to shatter the outmoded understanding about the fundamental nature of reality and replace it with a new one. Now that sounds like a major undertaking, and in some ways it is, but I also know this, the most likely reason why you were drawn to this book is that your past efforts to make any lasting change in your life physical, emotional, or spiritual have fallen short of the ideal of yourself that you imagined. 
And why those efforts failed has more to do with your beliefs about why your life is the way it is than anything else, including a perceived lack of will, time, courage, or imagination. Always, in order to change, we have to come to a new understanding of self and the world so we can embrace new knowledge and have new experiences. So that is what reading this book will do for you. Your past shortfalls can be traced at their root to one major oversight. You haven't committed yourself to living by the truth that your thoughts have consequences so great that they create your reality. You really do. The fact is that we are blessed. We all can reap the benefits of our constructive efforts. We don't have to settle for our present reality. We can create a new one whenever we choose to. We all have that ability because for the better or worse, our thoughts do influence our lives. Period and pause right here. In a nutshell, ladies and ladies and gentlemen, friends and gems, I just want to tell you, we really have that magic inside of us. It's an untapped potential. You know, one of the things that I find fascinating over my lifetime, there's been so many people, so many mentors and gurus that I've learned from and studied and read about and attended their seminars and so forth. And one of the things that I find fascinating is that sometimes the way one person languages something gets us to one up to a certain degree of evolution. And then somebody else may say, maybe it's the same thing, but it's said in a different light framed a little differently and that will propel us even further. And that's, I, I believe that that's what's happening right here, right now, as you are experiencing, reading, studying, applying and implementing this book and the practices that it talks about here, you are getting those ahas and you are seeing things from a different light, a different point of view, a different framing, if you will, that's allowing you to expand your consciousness from being limited to this 3D reality where you have these false truly false constraints to now recognizing and having you are actually having the awareness and realizing and noticing as well as understanding that your consciousness has no limitations it has no boundaries there are no limits you are one with it it is one with you you are tapped into that infinite source intelligence and it is tapped into you and the how to feel that, how to focus it, how to mold the energy, how to have that energy create that which you desire is not just within your reach. It's already inside of you. It is you. That's the biggest aha. You can be it, but your negative thoughts, you're fighting yourself. And that fight, that addiction to your old personality is what's keeping you. It keeps pushing it. And the better you are at fighting yourself, the more you push it away. And once you take reign of that and say, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. I recognize now I, now I understand the difference between my conscious mind, my focusing, my conscious mind, the role of my brain, the role of my ego, make no mistakes. Your ego is not your amigo. It's very much your enemigo. You can make your enemigo your amigo when it's put in the proper frame and it's used for the purpose for which it was brought forth. And then you can use it as that edge to identify the wanted and the unwanted and to recognize where it's trying to limit you, which is also showing you where you are limitless a paradox. So I'm sure you've heard that before, but I wonder whether most people really believe this statement on a gut level. If we really and truly embrace the notion that our thoughts produce tangible effects in our lives, wouldn't we strive to never let one thought slip us that we didn't want to experience? And wouldn't we focus our attention on what we want instead of continually obsessing about problems? Think about it. If you really knew that this principle were true, would you ever miss a day in intentionally creating your desired destiny? 
I don't think so. To change your life, change your beliefs about the nature of reality. Pause button here. Pay attention. To change your life, change your beliefs about the nature of reality. I hope this book will shift your view of how our world operates, convince you that you are more powerful than you knew, and inspire you to demonstrate the understanding that you think and believe has a profound effect on your world. Until you break free from the way you see your present reality, any change in your life will always be haphazard and transitory. You have to overhaul your thinking about why things happen in order to produce enduring and desired outcomes. To do that, you'll need to be open to a new interpretation of what is real and true to help you shift into this mode of thought and begin to create a new life of your choosing. I have to begin with a bit of cosmology, the study of the structure and the dynamics of the universe, but don't be alarmed. We're merely going to skim through the nature of reality 101. About it, have, I'm sorry, the nature of reality 101 and how some of our views about it have evolved to reach our present understanding. All of this to explain of necessity in a brief and simple way, how it is possible that your thoughts shape your destiny. This chapter just might test your willingness to abandon ideas that have in a sense been programmed into you for many years on a conscious and subconscious level. And once you gain a new conception of the fundamental forces and elements that constitute reality, it won't fit into that old perception in which the linear and the orderly rule the day. Be prepared to experience some fundamental shifts in understanding. In fact, as you begin to embrace this new outlook, your very makeup as a human being will change. It is my wish that you will no longer be the same person you were when you began. Obviously, I'm about to challenge you, but I want you to know that I'm entirely empathetic because I too have had to let go of what I thought was true and leap into the unknown. To ease into this new way of thinking about the nature of our world, let's see how our worldview was shaped by the early belief that mind and matter were separate things. Always matter. Never mind. Always mind. Never matter. Connecting the dots between the outer physical world of the observable and inner mental world of thought has always been presented quite a challenge to scientists and philosophers. And to many of us, even today, the mind appears to have little or no measurable effects on the world of matter. Although we probably agree that the world of matter creates consequences affecting our minds, how can our minds possibly produce any physical changes affecting the solid things in our lives? Mind and matter appear to be separate. That is, unless there's a shift in our understanding about the way physical solid things actually exist. Well, there's been such a shift, and to trace its beginnings, we don't have to go back very far. For much of what historians considered modern times, humanity believed that nature of the universe was orderly and thus predictable and explainable. Consider 17th century mathematician and philosopher Rene Descartes, who developed many concepts that still have a great relevance to mathematics and other fields. Does I think, therefore, I am ring any bells? In retrospect, however, one of his theories ultimately did more harm than good. Descartes was a proponent. He was a proponent of the mechanistic model of the universe, a view that the universe is controlled by predictable laws. Now, when it came to human thought, Descartes faced a real challenge. The human mind possessed too many variables to neatly fit into any laws. So since he couldn't unify his understanding of the physical world with that of the new mind, but he had to account for the presence of both. Descartes played a nifty mind game, pun intended. He said that the mind was not subject to the laws of the objective physical world. So it was completely outside the bounds of the scientific inquiry 
the study of the matter was the jurisdiction of the science. Always matter, never mind. Whereas the mind was God's instrument, so the study of it fell to religion. Always mind, never matter. The opposite. <clears throat> Essentially, Descartes started a belief system that imposed a duality between the concepts of mind and matter. So for centuries, the division stood as the accepted understanding of the nature of reality. So helping to perpetuate Descartes' beliefs were the experiments and theories of Sir Isaac Newton. The English mathematician and scientist not only solidified, the English mathematician and scientist not only solidified the concept of the universe as a machine, but he produced a set of laws stating that human beings could precisely determine, calculate, and predict the orderly ways in which the physical world would operate. So according to the classical Newtonian physics model, all things were considered solid. For example, energy could be explained as a force to move objects or to change the physical state of matter. But as you will see, energy is much more than an outside force exerted on material things. Energy is the very fabric of all things material and is responsive to mind. Pay attention, highlight that in your book. Energy is the very fabric of all things material and is responsive to mind. It's with this that we change the energy, it's with the focused mind. So by extension, the work of Descartes and Newton, I was gonna say Newtonian physics. So by extension, the work of Descartes and Newton established a mindset that if reality operated on mechanistic principles, then humanity had little influence on outcomes. All of reality was predetermined. I'm gonna pause right here because it reminds me in Presbyterianism, which is one of the Protestant Christian uh, religions. They believe in predestination. And um, many of the Protestant religions and even the Catholic religion, I believe, believes in predestination where you don't have, you do have free will, but that certain things are your fate and you're destined to have happen to you. And a lot of it is out of your control and in God's hands. And it is in God's hands, but it's not the way they've framed it. And that's what you're going to learn here. Thank God, quite literally. So all of reality was predetermined. Given that outlook, it is any wonder that human beings struggled with the idea that their actions mattered, let alone entertain the notion that their thoughts mattered or that free will played any part in the grand scheme of things. Don't many of us still labor today, subconsciously or consciously, under the assumption that we humans are often little more than victims? Considering that these cherished beliefs held sway for centuries, it took some revolutionary thought to counter Descartes and Newton. Einstein, not just rocking the boat, rocking the universe. So about 200 years after Newton, Albert Einstein produced his famous equation, E equals MC squared, demonstrating that energy and matter are so fundamentally related that they are one and the same. Essentially, his work showed that matter and energy are completely interchangeable. So you can interchange them at any given point in time. This directly contradicted Newton and Descartes and ushered in a new understanding of how the universe functions. Isn't that incredible? Pause, little sidebar here. I bet you don't know this little fact or this little bit of trivia. Did you know that Einstein was autistic, had, had ADD, ADD, ADHD, and autistic? And um, he didn't do very well in school and in mathematics uh, in elementary school, which is kind of surprising given that he is known as one of the most brilliant minds that has ever existed. And yet he had some of those perceived challenges. And it's those perceived exact same perceived challenges, which is what led to him being able to, because he was thinking outside of the box, he was able to have the discoveries that he did. 
So Einstein didn't single-handedly crumble our previous view of the nature of reality, but he did undermine its foundation. And that eventually led to the collapse of some of our narrow, rigid ways of thinking. His theory set off an exploration of puzzling behavior of light. Scientists then observed that light sometimes behaves like a wave when it bends around a corner, for example. And at other times, it behaves like a particle. How could light be both a wave and a particle? According to the outlook of Descartes and Newton, it couldn't. A phenomenon had to be either one or the other. Quickly, it became clear that the dualistic Cartesian Newtonian model was flawed at the most basic level of all the subatomic subatomic refers to the parts electrons protons neutrons and so on that make up atoms which are the building blocks of all things physical the most fundamental components of our so-called physical world are both waves of energy and particles physical matter depending on the mind of the observer will come back to that so to understand how the world works we had to look to its tiniest components Thus, out of these particular experiments, a new field of science was born called quantum physics. The solid ground we stand on isn't. This change was a complete reimagining of the world we thought we lived in, and it led to the proverbial rug being pulled out from under our feet. Feet we used to think were planted on solid ground. How so? Think back to the old toothpick and styrofoam ball models of the atom. Before quantum physics came along, people believed that an atom was made of relatively solid nucleus with smaller, less substantial objects either located in it or around it. And the very idea that with a powerful enough instrument, we could measure, calculate the mass of, and count number the subatomic particles that made up an atom that made them seem as inert as cows grazing in a pasture. Atoms seemed to be made of solid stuff, right? Figure 1A, the old school classical Newtonian version of an atom. The focus is primarily on material. Nothing could be further from the truth as revealed by the quantum model. Atoms are mostly empty space, as we read. Actually, in the beginning of this book, it's 99.99999% space and only 0.00001% particle mass. Think about this. Everything physical in your life is not solid. Rather, it's all fields of energy or frequency patterns of information all matter is more no thing than some thing. Ooh, I just had an aha here. That's what Einstein meant about the theory of relativity because all matter is more no thing than some thing. It's relative one to the other because matter it's no thing because it's energy waveforms and it's something because it's also the particles. The fact that it has the waveform of energy is what gives us the ability as the one who uses our awareness to focus on the energy portion of the matter to morph it into our desired outcome. Figure 1b, the new school quantum version of an atom with an electron cloud. The atom is 99.99999, that's five nines, percent energy and 0.0001 percent matter. That's four zeros. It's just about nothing materially, and I'm going to add literally. Figure 1c, this is the most realistic model of any atom. It is no thing materially, but all things potentially. I'm going to read that again because that is that is like at the foundation of why we can do what we can do in meditation. It is 
nothing, no thing, because it's wave energy, materially, but all things potentially, potentially any particle based on the amount of focus and attention that we give to whatever it is that we want, we can change those waveforms so that there's more and more particles. So it can be no thing and something simultaneously, solely by our using our focus, conscious awareness, and having our focus like a laser beam, put attention on it, is what makes all the difference in the world. Another puzzle, subatomic particles and larger objects play by different rules. So, but this alone wasn't enough to explain the nature of reality. Einstein and others had other puzzles to solve. Matter didn't always seem to behave in the same ways. When physicists began observing and measuring the tiny world of the atom, they noticed that at the subatomic level, the fundamental elements of the atom didn't obey the laws of classic physics the way that larger objects did. Events involving objects in large world were predictable, reproducible, and consistent. But when that legendary apple fell from a tree and moved toward the center of the earth until it collided with Newton's head, its mass accelerated with a consistent force, but electrons as particles behaved in unpredictable, unusual ways. When they interacted with the nucleus of the atom and moved towards its center, they gained and lost energy appeared and disappeared and seemed to show up all over the place without regard to the boundaries of time and space. Did the world of the small and the world of the large operate very different sets of rules? Since subatomic particles like electrons were the building blocks of everything in nature, how could they be subject to one set of rules and the things they made up behave according to another set of rules. From matter to energy, particles pull off the ultimate vanishing act. At the level of electrons, scientists can measure energy. Dependent character characteristics such as wavelength, voltage potentials, and the like. But these particles have a mass that is so infinitesimally small and exists so temporarily as to be almost non-existent. This is what makes the subatomic world unique. It possesses not just physical qualities, but also energetic qualities. In truth, matter on a subatomic level exists as a momentary phenomenon. It's so elusive that it constantly appears and disappears, appearing into three dimensions and disappearing into nothing, into the quantum field, in no space, no time, transforming from particle to wave energy and vice versa. But where do particles go when they vanish into thin air? It's a fair question. So figure 1D, the electron exists as a wave of probability in one moment, and then in the next moment appears as a solid particle, then disappears into nothing, and then reappears at another location. I can imagine being one of those researchers, how perplexing that would be because it's challenging everything they've ever been taught. So the creation of reality, energy responds to mindful attention. So consider again the old school toothpick and styrofoam ball model of how atoms were constructed. Back then, weren't we led to believe that electrons orbited about the nucleus like planets around the sun? If so, we could pinpoint their location, couldn't we? The answer is yes, in the manner of speaking, but the reason is not at all what we used to think. What quantum physicists discovered was that the person observing or measuring the tiny particles that made up the atoms affects the behavior of the energy and matter. So quantum experiments, is, ex, quantum experiments demonstrated that electrons exist simultaneously in an infinite array of possibilities or probabilities in an invisible field of energy. Wow. I'm going to read that again because that's why we can change our reality. Quantum experiments demonstrated, they, they 
did a demo that proved and showed that electrons exist at the same time in an infinite array of possibilities or probabilities in an invisible field of energy. All the potentials exist in this particular dimension or this plane, but only when an observer focuses attention on any location of any one electron, does that electron appear. So as soon as you put your attention on it, then the electron appears. Until then, the electron's not there. Holy cow. In other words, a particle cannot manifest in reality, that is, ordinary space, time as we know it, until we observe it. Whoa. So quantum physics calls this phenomenon collapse of the wave function or the observer effect. Hit the pause button here because because quantum physicists were able to discover this collapse of the wave function that it says here, collapse of the wave function or the observer effect by you being the observer of the energy of what it is that you're putting your focus and your attention on that collapses the wave function of whatever it is so that that wave function can now turn into the particles of what it is that you're focusing on, what it is that you want. Now I got to make a comment here about wanting because wanting implies separation. And I know it's early in the book. So but I, I want you to get this and to embrace this the sooner, the better, the less resistance, the more that you embrace these principles and really take charge of it and make it your own because it is yours. It's your birthright. You were, you were born, born actually knowing all of this and then you lost it and now you're regaining it. So make no mistakes, whatever it is that you want, or if you see something unwanted, don't fret. You're recognizing, ew, oh no, ah, I don't want this. Okay, stop. What do you need to do? I sound like a scratch record, but it's the formula. It's how this works. You hit the pause button and you're like, I'm going to slow down my heart rate. I'm going to slow down my breath. I'm going to slow down my brain waves. And I'm going to command my brain to go into theta. Because now that I'm in theta, I can go into 5D. Now I focus on what it is that I'm wanting to manifest. I'm also, I'm almost, um, I'm trying to I'm be more conscious and mindful of the word want because want implies separation. The brain doesn't know any difference. So if I in quantum, when I've been successful at manifesting stuff, I didn't come from a place of want. I was creating and focusing on the reality, the future reality that I wanted to be in my present. And in that state, I acted as if it was right now. And then I had the elevated emotion of love and I had heart and brain coherence. And in having heart coherence and brain coherence, once you connect those two and you add that elevated emotion of love and then you bathe it with gratitude and then the bow is gratitude and appreciation. And you're like, yes, yes, you're in, in, in genuine thankfulness because you've created it in that realm as if it were right now your brain doesn't know that that's a future that you're future casting or future creating it thinks that that's happening now because when you act and feel grateful and appreciative you're holding it in higher regard and higher appreciation and, and a higher status it's assuming, oh, she must have got it. That's why she's in appreciation and gratitude. Now it's treating it as it's a memory of the past. Now we're making some, pun intended, headway. Now we're making some headway, but it's supercharged by our heart and our brain coherence. So quantum physicists call this phenomenon collapse of the function or the observer effect. We now know that the moment the observer looks for an electron, there is a specific point in time and space when all probabilities of the electron collapse into that physical event. With this discovery, mind and matter can no longer be considered separate. They are one. They are intrinsically related because subjective mind produces measurable changes on the objective uh, physical world. 
So let's make a clear distinction between subjective versus objective. When something is subject to, then it's outside of you and below you. When you are objectively looking at something, you are, instead of seeing your instead of seeing yourself or self over there so that you are the witnesser and you are observing yourself over there subjectively as as an objective observer you are seeing through your own eyes you're reliving that experience in the first person which is how we live our lives we don't live our lives 3d subjectively we live our lives objectively we are subjective to other people but our own life experience is an objective experience we are the object and we are through our eyes objectively experiencing sensing feeling and emoting everything that's around us does that make sense so are you beginning to see why chapter why this chapter is titled the quantum you at the subatomic level, energy responds to your mindful attention and becomes matter. Let's read that again, because that's another highlighted sentence. At the subatomic level, energy responds to your mind, attention, and it becomes matter. Yeah, because you're taking the waveforms of energy by putting focus and attention on it, so you're putting your attention on these wave part, wave energy forms, potential wave energy forms, and now they turn into particles just by your looking at them. So they're going from energy forms and converting into particles. And the more you do that, the more particles start to coalesce. And when you have enough of them, then they pop out into your 3D reality. That's how it works. So how would your life change if you learn to direct the observer effect and to collapse infinite waves of probability into the reality that you choose. Could you get better at observing the life you want? An infinite number of possible realities await the observer. So ponder this, everything in the physical universe is made, of, made up of subatomic particles, such as electrons. So by their very nature, these particles, when they exist as pure potential, are in their wave state while they are not being observed. So when you're not looking at them, they're all waveforms. And as soon as you start to look at them, they go from waveforms to they turn into particles. So they are potentially everything and no thing until they're observed. And you are the one that gets to observe. They exist everywhere and nowhere until they are observed. Thus, everything in our physical reality exists as pure potential. If subatomic particles can exist in an infinite number of possibilities and of possible places simultaneously, we are potentially capable of collapsing into existence an infinite number of possible realities. In other words, if you can imagine a future event in your life based on any one of your personal desires, that reality already exists as a possibility in the quantum field, waiting to be observed by you. If your mind can influence the appearance of an electron, then theoretically it can influence the appearance of any possibility. So we gotta stop here because this is so juicy, this is so good. This is part of the key to everything. You need to know that there's no such thing as anything being impossible. If you have the desire for something to be, if you want to create a greater level of health, let's say that you're right now, you're watching this, this broadcast. Let's say that you are confined to a wheelchair and let's say that you are, let's say that you're paralyzed from the neck down as my son was. My son went from being able to run black diamond slopes and from doing moguls on black diamond runs, expert level skiing at 11 years of age, he was paralyzed from the neck down. Fast forward a year later, actually less than a year later, five, five months later. Yeah. Five months later, he was back in the pool. Believe it or not playing water polo. Any of you who have any notion 
uh, any experience with water polo, you know that you have to have an incredible amount of physical endurance and they make you, 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 you know, you do dry training, which is above ground, usually an hour and a half of dry training and then another hour and a half or two in the water training. It is super intense, super aggressive. It takes a, it's a full body strength. You have to have an amazing strong core for that. And so he went from, I mean, he could not hold a pencil, couldn't zip up a shirt, couldn't button. He was paralyzed from the neck down when he left the hospital. And five months later, he was playing water polo. Albeit he wasn't jumping, he was falling off diving boards <laughs> because he couldn't get up by himself. He needed assistance, but he was back in the pool. And within a year, he basically was at 99% recovery, which is where he stands today. He still has a tiny little bit of a shape, which is his only reminder that, that he actually had that. And so it's possible for you. It doesn't matter. Even if it seems, if you have a loved one right now who um, had some sort of brain injury and they can barely speak, you know, I had a revelation. It was yesterday. It was so, I had a, another very mystical um, meditation yesterday. And in that meditation, I became profoundly aware of people who are in vegetative coma, coma states, uh, people who are, um, have had brain injuries where they're confined to wheelchairs where they can't really speak and, um, and maybe um, doctors and loved ones are not exactly sure how much, how much of their soul is there and how much of their um, awareness and consciousness is there. And I had the profound awareness that they're, they're, they're literally trapped inside their bodies, you know, screaming to get up, but they just can't say it. And one of the things that I've learned, um, not just through this work, but I learned it really through the experience that I had with my son having to get over the Guillain-Barre syndrome and him, in essence, going, you know, he almost died from that. But the powerful connection that a mother has with her child and it doesn't matter if it's, you know, a natural born child that you birthed, if you're a surrogate mother that birthed the child for another, or if you ad adopted the child and the child was born in your heart. And I really do believe that, you know, someday we're going to be able to energetically be able to prove that, that um, children who are adopted by certain parents, we're going to be able to see, I think, uh, some sort of energetic imprint that shows how a mother actually gives birth through her heart energy center and it, there comes a point in time it, it's no different than soulmates twin flames you know romantic partners who you know across the globe find each other and it's that same type of phenomena it's it, but with a mother and child it's not romantic it's you know the mother the, the love of a mother for a child and the, the love of the child for the mother all that to say that because we're, our conversation here and the information that's just been shared with you right now is about energy and about how until you absorb, observe any particular thing, it is when you're not paying attention to it, it's your energy potential waveforms of energy. As soon as you look at it, those waveforms turn into particles. And the more you observe it, the more particles start to add up to each other till you have enough of them that they coalesce and then they can pop out into 3d so that's why we've been able to have people during our seven day advanced events at the monasteries at dr joe's and make no mistake it's not limited to people who are going to the seven day events there are people who have never attended and have also had these extraordinary results who are from home from the hospitals, from their hospital, wherever it is that they are, them and their relatives, both and or any combination thereof are doing this. But my message to you, just as a parent and as a mother, make no mistakes, because I, I, I'm the only person I know that is talking about this, but you, your, your child, I don't care if your child, if, you, if they're six days old, six months old, or if they're 16 years old or 60 years old, you haven't, your toroidal electromagnetic field is 
it's you know the entanglement theory which quantum physicists have now proven too you are combined and you are entangled with them so they are whether you are aware of it or not they are automatically reacting to you and if you don't think that they can get better they are not going to get better plain and simple because you know uh, i can elaborate on this and i've done some videos on this i'll have to see if i can don't remember i don't think they're um, all produced um, right now, but I'll work on getting some of those done because I think this is, there is something so powerful here. And I've seen such incredible things just over the last, since last year, since 2019, since I want to say from September, October until now of just mothers that I've talked to and certain fathers, because I've had some fathers who reached out to me because their son, you know, had lung cancer or this other child had this neurological disorder or whatnot people with kids of, of, of all ages, teenagers, babies, you know, grown adults. And this particular sliver of information, I think is such a critical piece. Um, that child with that parent is not alone and vice versa. And you have far more power than you recognize. And, and if you get a chance, I think there's a movie called Breakthrough and um, right now I'm forgetting the name of the, I'll see if I can link it. Uh, I'll put the name in the description of this video so you can check it out. But it's a mother who adopted a son and he was playing on the ice on a lake that was iced over with his two best friends. And then of course they started jumping on the ice and as bad luck would have it, he ended up falling through the ice. He, um, you, you know, he died, came back and then they thought he wasn't gonna make it. And the movie actually shows how her love pulled him back from death into life. And the way she, she had an amazing amount of self-mastery. You watch her and she would not allow herself or anybody else. She would not allow even anybody on the medical team to allow themselves the luxury of a negative thought in any form. If, if, if whether it was a nurse, a medical technician, a custodian coming to change the, the trash in um, the ICU, if, if, unless you had the belief that her son was going to make it, you were not allowed to treat her son. Any doctor that didn't 100% buy into her son making it was out to the point where she was brutal about it, but she was not going to let her baby die. And her love pulled that child through. If you haven't seen the movie, I would, and it's based on a true story. Check it out if you haven't checked, if you haven't watched it, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal story. And the thing is that some of the characters that played an integral role in saving him were people who didn't believe in God, weren't spiritual, and yet, um, I don't want, I'm getting the, <laughs> the gut incidents feeling, um, but there were things that happened that they couldn't explain and they knew that there was a supernatural energetic force that had its hand in making sure that that child made it. It's incredible. It's an incredible, incredible movie. You got to watch it. It's really fantastic. So, so in theory, theoretically, it can influence the appearance of any possibility, which is what we were just talking about. This means that the quantum field contains a reality in which you are healthy, wealthy, and happy, and possess all the qualities and capabilities of the idealized self that you hold in your thoughts. So stay with me, and you will see that with willful attention, sincere application of new knowledge, and repeated daily efforts, you can use your mind as the observer to collapse the quantum particles and organize a vast number of subatomic waves of probability into a desired physical event called an experience in your life. Like clay, the energy of infinite possibilities is shaped by consciousness, your mind, and if all matter is made of energy, it makes sense that consciousness, mind, in this case, as Newton and Descartes called it, and energy, matter, according to the quantum model, are so intimately related that they are one. Mind and matter are completely entangled. Your consciousness, mind, has effects on energy, matter, because your consciousness is energy, and energy has consciousness. 
I'm going to pause right here. Not only does all energy have consciousness, but now one of the things that does, um, quantum physicists have discovered and have been able to confirm is that every cell in your body, first of all, each of your eight energy centers, you have you know, your first, your second, your third, your fourth, your fifth, your sixth, your seventh, and your eighth energy center all have not only a mind and brain of its own, each one has its own level of consciousness. Take it a step down, every, every organ in your body has its own consciousness, every cell in your body has its own consciousness, and every atom in your body has its own consciousness. So make no mistakes when you're doing these meditations, you are commanding every cell of the 50 trillion cells that you have in your body, you're commanding them all that consciousness. You're commanding that like a laser light to focus on what it is that you want to manifest the outcome of health, wealth, prosperity, happiness, success, an experience, a mystical experience, whatever the case might be. Okay. So you are powerful enough to influence matter because at the most elementary level, you are energy with a consciousness and you are mindful matter. In the quantum model, the physical universe is immaterial, interconnected, unified field of information, potentially everything, but physically nothing. The quantum universe is just waiting for a conscious observer, you or me, to come along and influence energy in the form of potential matter by using the mind and consciousness, which are themselves energy, to make waves of energetic probabilities coalesce into physical matter, just as the wave of possibility of the electron manifests as a particle within a specific momentary event, we observers cause a particle or groups of particles to manifest physical experiences in the form of events in our lives. Pause button here. I've talked about this before and I'll talk about this again, how I was able to, when I was in Victoria, British Columbia, I was in Victoria and I actually left on the plane, um, this phone, as a matter of fact, I left this phone on the plane and long story short, when I left it on the plane and I recognized it, it was, you know, we, we got into the airport at 1230 at night. So by the time we got into our room, it was like two in the morning. Once I got there, I went to look through my phone and that's when I realized, oh, crud, I left it on the plane on my seat. And then, you know, you do Google locate and I could see that it was still there at Delta. So long story short, I'm like, I did not entertain the possibility that I was not going to get that phone back. I, because I use this meditation already to manifest other things, and I had manifested other things, I'm going to manifest that phone back. Long story short, I did manifest the phone back. And in fact, I think I can even show you on my phone here, the name of the airline stewardess who actually sent it back to me, Maureen. So she ended up five weeks. It took me five weeks, but the point is, who recovers a lost or stolen phone at an international airport? Nobody, but I did. So here, uh, her, her name is Maureen Wing. How do you pronounce her last name? Wing Gardner, I think it was. Hi, more. Okay, so she called me. So then I, I'm replying back to her. This was August 17th. I was there the last week of July. Hi, Maureen. I just emailed my FedEx account number and ship address. Let me know you got it. I got a phone call from her. She said, Lillian. We found your phone. Just give me your FedEx account number. And on Monday, I will go to uh, FedEx and I will ship you your phone back. And sure enough, so if you can see here, I don't know if it's going to show up backwards. If you can see, there's her. And then the second message says, perfect, I got it. I'll let you know when it has been shipped. And then she put, I just checked the FedEx site near the airport and they open on Monday. So I will ship it then. Have a great weekend. Super, thank you. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Here's my FedEx tracking number. I sent her a picture of myself so she would know what I looked like. And I said, "Hey, when you come to Huntington Beach, because she says she sometimes comes to California." I said, "You know, come on over, and maybe we can paddleboard. And um, if you want to learn, I'll show you how." Yada yada. Long story short, she sent me a picture of her. <laughs> 
I also have a picture of her Delta Airlines. Let's see. And let's see. And I have a picture here of her. Here's her De Delta Airlines. That's her. The one on um, this side is her. There's Maureen. So the meditations work for everything. This is crucial to understanding how you can cause an effect. I cause that effect. Or make a change in your life when you learn how to sharpen your skills of observation to intentionally affect your destiny. You are well on your way toward living the ideal version of your life by becoming the idealized version of yourself. We are connect. Okay, next section. We are connected to everything in the quantum field. Like everything else in the universe, we are, in a sense, connected to a sea of information in a dimension beyond physical space and time. That's why when you go into 5D, you're connected to all of it. We don't need to be touching or even in close proximity to any physical element in the quantum field to affect or be affected by them. The physical body is organized patterns of energy and information, which is unified with everything in the quantum field. You, like all of us, broadcast a distinct energy pattern or signature. In fact, everything material is always emitting specific patterns of energy, and this energy carries information. Your fluctuating states of mind consciously or unconsciously change that signature on a moment-to-moment -moment basis because you are more than just a physical body. You are a consciousness using a body and the brain inside this bucket. So you're using a body and a brain to express different levels of mind. Another way to look at how we humans and the quantum field are interconnected is through the concept of quantum entanglement or quantum non-local connection. Essentially, once two particles can be initially linked in some way, they always be they will always be bonded together beyond space and time. As a result, anything that is done, I've got to stop here real quick because the camera stopped. Okay, you know what? We started 9.30, 10.30, 11.30. It's been all two hours. I think we're going to stop here at this section. As Okay, we're just going to finish this thought. As a result, anything that is done to one will be done to the other, even though they are spe spatially separated from one another. This means that since we two are made up of particles, we are all implicitly connected beyond space and time. What we do unto others, we do unto ourselves. So I'm going to... We're going to stop right there and we will pick up part two of this chapter tomorrow night because we're already going two hours and it's going to take a long time to render this. So thank you for tuning in, tapping in, turning on to Love and Money Secrets TV. And I hope you are enjoying and learning a lot through this book by Dr. Joe Dispenza called Breaking the Habit of Becoming Yourself. Yeah, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself by Dr. Joe Dispenza. If you have any questions, any comments or concerns, please feel free to reach out to me. If you're interested in having a neuro health reset, that's the first place I always start with anybody who has any kind of pain. If you have pain anywhere, head to toe, anywhere in your body, and if you can point toward, to it, then uh, we can get rid of it. If, um, and whether and if or if you're feeling fear, anxiety, depression, sadness, grief, sorrow, um, unexplicable, a melancholy, an overall heaviness, um, gravitas over your body, uh, there's probably some sort of emotional. In fact, there is an emotional root to that. So we can, you know, I can address that with you. You can book a private session with me, or you can watch. You can start off by watching the um, how to do a neuro 
uh, health reset and you can watch that and do that in the comfort of your home. But if you would like one on one instruction, you'd like me to guide you through that process, then by all means, you can book a session and we can kind of take it from there. But thank you for tuning in, tapping in, turning on. And um, I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. I'm really having fun with this. Please, let's use the comments below, like so that this is like an online class. So you can ask me whatever questions, share any of your experiences as you as you start doing the meditations. Go to Dr. Joe Dispenza's website and actually order his uh, Breaking the Habit of Becoming Yourself. Order, you know, that, that, that actually comes with an introduction and then two meditations, the body parts meditation and the body parts meditation and the water rising meditation. So you get two full-blown meditations when you buy that one packet. So get those, those are, that's an awesome place to start. And if you want a third recommendation, I would say blessing of the energy centers, either get six or seven, whatever the highest number that's available for blessing of the energy centers. Start off with those three. And then I have others that I would recommend too, but out the gate, those are the first three that I would that I would start with because that's what I started with. And um, the, the uh, fact that he takes you through a process that gives you actual induction, which he talked about in Becoming Supernatural, and I'm sure he'll, he's going to address it in this book too. So let's use this as a living online classroom. We're going to keep on elaborating on this information. There's no such thing as a bad, as a bad meditation. So the key thing is don't worry about whatever thoughts that you have. As you're doing these guided meditations, you're listening to his instruction. As you're listening to his instruction, just follow what he tells you to do. Keep it simple. Don't make it complicated. When he says, you know, in the blackness, in the void, in space, doesn't mean outer space, doesn't mean you need to populate your imagination with what the galaxy looks like so with all the stars and all the planets. Nonsense. You don't need to do any of that. It's black void space. That's what he means by the space. Okay. And whatever questions you have, you know, let's use this as an online discussion and let's have some interesting conversation. If you have any mystical experiences, if you have any cool manifestations, if you realize that you've healed yourself from, from eczema or, or maybe your eyesight all of a sudden became 2020 or 2010 or whatever it is that you're manifesting, I would love, absolutely adore to hear from you. It would give me no greater joy than to hear from you. So I do read all the comments. I do reply to all of them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for those of you who have sent donations, thank you very much for that too. I really appreciate it from all over the world. It's so exciting. We have such a global community. It's really awesome. So that's it. We are going to end this broadcast now. I'm Dame Lillian Walker. And thank you from the bottom of my heart to your heart. Let's get heart and brain coherence together. Oh, and let me know. Do you have, have you been affected by Go Love 20? Or if you haven't been affected by Go Love 20, then you probably don't have the mutation. But let me know. And if you don't know what Go Love 20 is, then the answer is no. Let me know. I can affect you with Go Love 20. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Okay. Okay. Bye, my friends and gems. Ciao for now.